So I woke up today and I thought, let's do a search on quantum grammar on YouTube. So I did. And this is what came up. This was two months ago. Chris Brooks, LSB Film Productions, period. Now isn't this interesting, folks? This was written by the For the Quantum hyphen Grammar hyphen channel dangling participle colon in their name. But they put this in brackets and then a period and a space and then a colon and then a space. So I do think they've been watching my channel and maybe learning a little bit. They just haven't gotten their closure on it because you're... All right, my students out there that are serious, studying every day out there, really putting the work in, they will know what's wrong with this title. In any case, I found this. So I'm like, okay, well, I don't want to watch it secondhand on Quantum Grammar Channel. I want to see the actual Chris Brooks. I want to see it on Chris Brooks' channel. So I looked it up. LSB Film Productions. So I clicked videos. And as you can see over here, it was two months ago published on the Quantum Grammar Channel. So I'm going to be looking for the tagline over here two months ago. You see six days ago. You see 12 days ago. And you see the usual cast of characters in this type of channel that would have someone like Russell J. Gould on. They have like Sasha Stone on there and other fringe, I guess, alternative uh right-wing type people. So we got one month ago. Oh, we got Richard Vobes on here. Richard Vobes banned from YouTube. I think that's not correct. I think Richard Vobes is actually still on YouTube. So careful. That might be clickbait, folks. So two months ago. Okay. Now I'm looking very closely here. I'm done with YouTube. Obviously not the case. Obviously not the case. <laughs> okay, so we're looking for this video with Russell J. Gould. I don't see it. Two months ago, two months ago. I absolutely... Do you see it, folks? Three months ago. Do you, ladies and gents, see Russell J. Gould anywhere in this video selection of LSB Film Productions podcasts? Unless it's older than two months ago. There's Richard Vobes again. He must be a regular guest. Which Oh, oh. Four months ago. Okay, there it is. I'm pretty sure this is the one. It appears as though I have found it. So, I have not seen this yet. So, you and I are going to watch it together. And I'm going to give you my take on it. As viewed through the lens of correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar. So, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be looking for Russell or whomever that's on this podcast to at least in concept, be correct grammatically, in concept. And what I mean by that is lining up with the principles of the balance of the honor and the grace, the possession, or I'm sorry, the maintenance of the rule one, rule equal. And uh, of course, the position of peace and neutrality. I'm going to be looking for those three principles throughout this video. And I'm going to be looking for any grammatical knowledge at all outside of what Ru Russell usually spews out, you know, his oh, vowel in front of two consonants or RE means no. And, you know, the regular mantra. Let, let's, let's see something new here. Because if we don't see anything new, what's that old saying? You can't teach an old dog new tricks. Maybe... If he doesn't share anything new, it's because he doesn't know anything other than those things he's been repeating. But I digress. I don't want to go into this with a bias. I'm going to go into it open-minded and hope 
that we see something positive here. So let's do it. Are you concerned about all this corruption being misgendered as conspiracies? What did they just say? Are you concerned about all this corruption being misgendered as conspiracies? Are you concerned about all this corruption being misgendered as conspiracies? Are you concerned about all of this corruption being misgendered as conspiracy? What in the living H-E double hockey sticks does that mean? Right off the bat, the first phrase uttered in this video, <laughs> they talk about gender, which is male or female, or hermaphrodite, three genders, and then they're talking about corruption and conspiracy. What does gender have to do with corruption or conspiracy? So, folks, I'm being a little over the top here. However, I'm just sharing with you that whoever runs this channel is not into correct grammar. I can tell you that just from that very first phrase, that's not what they're into. What they're into is hype, drama, and to use what they call turn of phrase or colorful artistic language to get a, a point across. I mean, I, I know what they're talking about. Mis using, you know, woke terms of misgendered as conspiracy as corruption. Corruption is conspiracy. To me, that's goofy. But I mean, maybe it gets them clicks. I mean, hell, they got 12.3 thousand subscribers. So, I mean, way more than I do. So what do I know, right? Folks are more into stuff like that than they are in, uh, into correct grammar. So... It is what it is. Just thought I'd point that out, though. Well, don't you worry. Sit back, relax, and join in the conversation as we talk with today's guest. Welcome to another LSB Film Productions podcast with your host, Chris Brooks. Hello, and welcome to the channel. Today, I've got an amazing guest. I've been watching all his stuff today to what try and catch up to speed, but there's hair. just so much of it that it's, it's a losing battle. So I'm so honored to have... Russell hyphen J colon goal <laughs> on the show with me. Um, a lot of you will probably know him from the brilliant documentary that was put together, The Last Flag Standing. Um, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you. It's an honor to be here. And I wonder if old Russ is upset with the way that they wrote his name there. To be, you know, to give closure to your audience on some of the wonderful things that have been created. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Take it away. <laughs> I want to be educated. Oh, well, I'd, I'd like to start first uh, to what everybody has, you know, when we come get docked on this Earth space banking. Rule one, rule equal? Certificate. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, no. un and unfortunately, this birth certificate has been used as a collateral for surety for underwritings for our whole lives um, from the government using for you know, for their QCIP numbers and for their bankings on the backside to our ability just to go get an education, to go to the doctor's office, to get a driver's license or a passport. Okay, so I just want to interject here real quick. What I'm noticing, now folks, I have watched literally thousands of hours of footage on that man right there, Russell J. Gould. And I've seen different mannerisms different uh, attitudes, auras, uh, if you will. This is the calm and collected and seemingly rational Russell. Okay, he's, he's speaking, he's really, he's... Keep in mind, folks, this is my perception. He's putting out there right off the bat with the birth certificate thing, something everyone can relate to. Literally everyone watching this has been given the birth certificate so he's bringing you in with that and my prediction is he's bringing you in with that so that he may down the line here in this podcast give you a solution to an imagined problem the problem being that you are trapped in a system by 
the certificate of live birth or the birth certificate, whatever you want to call it. A contract by which I'm saying a contract that you were not a part of because you were just born physically, birthed, B-E-R-T-H, into this domain, right? Your parents or guardians or whomever was there at the uh, location where you physically docked into this domain, they created this contract, this bill of the lading, for you. You obviously did not have the cognition to autograph anything, to sign anything, to thumbprint anything, to footprint, handprint, whatever it is. That was all done without your knowledge. So therefore, on, that, on the basis of all of that data alone, the birth certificate is null and void. When it comes down to you as an adult, a free-thinking individual, it's null and void because you're not a part of it. Just like the Constitution or the Bible or anything else, you were not a part of any of that. So therefore, it has no hold over you. But I digress. I'm, I'm getting too far into the way that I look at things. So I'm just going to hit this button and STFU. This concept of this birth certificate has been used to, to control the, the way we mo can move around. And so I took a look at that about 29 years ago, and I really uh, took an in-depth look at this uh, concept of shipping. And as I, as I started breaking down the concept of shipping from the, my local community and took it into the state level or, and then the national level and then the global level, I, I became cognizant that everything was a shipping matter of control. Mm -hmm. And as I looked at that, I realized, became cognizant about the grammar and how grammar was used as a means in those shipping constructs to control communication about what's being articulated. And so I st started on a long journey of studying words and how words get brought together through syntax, order of operation of breaking words down, mm -hmm. looking at prefixes and suffixes to words. And please keep in mind that not all words are the same in other languages. And so yeah, we have to true, use, yeah. This, yeah, yeah, it's it's true. So mm -hmm. we, I, I use if I'm using a word that's not the same in in Portuguese and maybe it's not the same in English, I look at the synonym to best correlate to maintain the same volition of thought. I'd like to point out that he mentioned 29 years ago he began looking at this. All right, and he mentions grammar about prefixes and suffixes. 29 years ago was 1995. Colin David Eiffelwing, Colin Miller brought quantum grammar in its earliest form, which was, I think, called in the truth language. He brought it to the public in 1988, which is almost a full decade before 1995, where Russell says he began thinking about these things. How old is Russell J. Gould? Well, folks, after about five minutes of frantic, exhausting searching, I have not been able to find Russell's birth date. Readily available on the internet. But I do remember that he's a couple years younger than me, and I'm 52. So let's just say he's 50, for argument's sake. He's somewhere around there anyways. So that would mean he would be born in 1974, physically birthed into this domain. So what we would do then is put 1995 
minus 1974. So when he was 21 years old, he started thinking about all this stuff all of a sudden. Even though David Wynn Miller had brought it to the public in 1988, David Wynn Miller was already using the grammar. So my question is, why hasn't, isn't Russell mentioning his teacher, his benefactor, his, if I may humbly state, father figure, Colin David Eiffelman, Colin Miller, why isn't he mentioning David's name? Because I'm pretty sure when Russell was about 19 years old or so, that that's when he met David Wynn Miller. And David took him under his wing and began teaching him this stuff. Why isn't Russell giving David any credit at all? Because if it really, folks, I don't know if you grasped the magnitude of this. If it weren't for Colin David Eiffel and Wayne Colin Miller, that guy would not be doing this podcast. I would not be speaking to you right now. That's the magnitude of it. And yet this fella has somehow seemingly neglected to mention Colin David Eiffel and Wayne Colin Miller's name. And I use a synonym to control that that word. But uh, yeah, I started looking at prefixes and suffixes. And prefix is what the, the prefix that comes in front of the, the root word, right, and then okay. the su the su the suffix is like your past tense. Or they'll use an l y like um, um, verily, or, you know, with an l y at the end of the end of the word, and that creates an adverb. I I figured out that all words that end in l y when you look at them. They're actually ad adverbs. That is 100% incorrect, folks. And I'm going to dwell on this. And I'm actually going to do a little mini class right here, right now, to show you why what he's saying, number one, is wrong. And number two, why I, by my perception and by my continuance of the evidence, know that he does not have closure on this grammar. He just said, an L-Y creates an adverb. He literally just said it. If that's the case, he used the word verily. Let's write that word out. Verily. In the uh, 10 parts of speech there, in your syntax key that you see on your screen, what part of speech is that? sitting on this page all by its lonesome. What part of speech is it? That's right. It's a pronoun. It's not an adverb. It's a pronoun. What about verily, verily? Oh, well, the first one's going to be an adverb. And the second one's going to be a dangling participle verb. Again, this one is a dangling participle verb. And look, it has the L-Y. What about verily, verily, verily? Now what happens? Well, the first one becomes a pronoun. Nothing can follow a pronoun except for a break in the continuance of the evidence or an adverb. And then again, we have the dangling participle verb. So now we have verily as a verb and also as a pronoun. So what he just said is 100% incorrect. And if he took the time to watch my channel, which I know that he has, but maybe he hasn't watched the tangible versus non-tangible contract words, uh, videos, you know, concerning the tangibility and non-tangibility and how one would credential that grammatically. 
Because if he would have, instead of saying what he said there, where he said, well, if I ever put an L-Y at the end of the word, it'd be, it's an adverb. The way to fix that would be to say, when you add L-Y as a suffix at the end of a word, it creates non-tangibility. It voids the tangibility of the word it's attached to. And it creates a non-tangible condition state. That would be the correct way to say that. But he doesn't say that. He said, it's an adverb. So I'm sure that's on his list of adverbs that he gives his students and his cult followers. But as you can plainly see here, verily is not always an adverb. And that is also a violation of rule one, rule equal, a violation of judge mechanics, because a judge has to get the whole story, folks, in order to get closure. They can't just look at a document and every time they see a word with an L-Y, they put a one above it, meaning it's an adverb. You can't do that. That's not fair. That's not rule one, rule equal. You have to get the whole story. You have to get the whole of the modification from port side to starboard side. So I have just shown you folks that Russell J. Gould does not have closure on this grammar by his own admission right there when he said that any word with an L-Y is an adverb. I'm sure he's going to give me more evidence as this interview goes on. But I'm, as the kids say, just saying. And so... And so, I mean, who who to know? I didn't know. My right? my daughter's an adverb. Her name's Lily. <laughs> yeah, L Y, right? Yeah. And so, when when you look at the at L I, so I changed that out to L I to take it out of the adverb scenario. And so, there's... so he changed the L Y to the L I to take it out of the adverb scenario. So he changed something. Change is modification. Modification is perjury. Need I say more? Now, to address what he just said there. If that gentleman's daughter's name is Lily, who cares? If you actually do the work and look up the word Lily, the L-Y is not credentialed as a suffix. Nowhere in this etymological data is L-Y credentialed as an adverb. It's not separate from the word, so therefore, it does not create a non-tangible condition of state, much like the word family. If you look up the word family, nowhere in the etymological data, historically, does it credential L-Y as being separate from the rest of the word, like L-Y was not added on to the word fami. You see what I'm saying? So therefore, family is tangible contract and it is positive performance. But then if you look up the word Russell used, verily, you can plainly see that the L-Y is added on as a suffix. So therefore, it poisons the tangibility of the word very, which very is tangible because it comes from the Proto-Indo-European root where oh, which means true and trustworthy. And I have a tangible contract with trust and trustworthy, don't you? There's different things that I did to create a, a position where we had a communication f forum where it was a now space scenario because I, I know that I can only be here now mm -hmm. and I only benefit and, and, and have things happen to me now. Uh, I never can see the future because that's someone else's paradigm. I can only live within the paradigm of the now space. I could, you know, the thought consciousness that's in my now space. Uh, I can create performances now that affect myself when I get in another space that they might may call the future, but when I get there, it's still now. So the right? present, really, isn't it? The present. Uh, well, pre means no, right? As a prefix to a word. Okay. And so you, and so you, I studied, I learned that, like when you go to a bank, like most people don't realize. Here comes the receipt. Deposit. 
Here it comes. But the prefix de means to separate de. from. And so you separate mm -hmm. from what? Your posit. And then the bank turns around and gives you a receipt. But the prefix re is a particle of negation. And what's negation mean? No. Mm -hmm. So they give you no, they give you nothing back. So, so you it, separate. It really is that words are spells. spells. It, it, the, the, it's a spelling. Yes, it's a. So when you go to a bank and you do your deposit, you separate yourself from your position, and then they give you a receipt give you nothing back so you can't verify that you left anything there because re means no the banks are playing a word game on you i challenge anyone out there who has a bank account which i can imagine that nine out of ten of you have bank accounts of some some form go to the bank and see if they're playing word games with you see if they know anything about what he's talking about about receipt deposit i'll bet you dollars to donuts they don't know anything about that they're just doing what's been implemented hundreds of years ago maybe thousands i don't know i have no way of verifying any of it but what i do know is that that guy right there obviously by the evidence i've just shown you does not have full closure on correct sentence structure communication parsley syntax grammar which by the way has not been mentioned one time in the five and a half minutes I've been watching this video. Now, just within that five and a half minutes, I've given you a lot on this channel. I've given you a lesson, and I've shown that, as I predicted at the beginning of the video, that Russell J. Gould is just regurgitating what he's been saying for years now. Nothing is really different. He's not offering any new data, no new knowledge. He's just repeating the stuff that he used to say when he was working under Colin David Eiffel and Colin Miller. The same stuff that David used to say, actually. And David passed it down to him, and now he's using it basically in a static position without adding anything to it, without trying to make it better, correcting it, or anything. Um, now, I'm not saying, I, I am not telling anyone to stop and correct. I'm not disqualifying anyone. None of that's going on here. Don't get the wrong impression, please. I'm just pointing out that through the evidence, what comes out of his mouth and his public paperwork, which has mistakes all over it, that guy does not have closure on the grammar. Now, it's up to him if he wants to fix that. I have given the tools to fix it. His dissertation on the LY, I showed the errors in it, and I also showed how to correct it. So I am maintaining rule one, rule equal, the balance of the honor and the grace. I'm showing the problem, gave the solution. I can't force him to accept the solution because that would be wrong. That would not be correct to force anyone to do anything. If you're trying to force someone to do something they don't want to do, then you are the bully and you are the one that is incorrect. And that's going to come back to bite you in the butt. I can guarantee that. So I just thought I'd take one little look at this and five and a half minutes is really all I need to see, to, sh to see that nothing is, is different. Nothing is updated. It's all still the same plan program for him and his folks, even though his conveyance right now is very calm and laid back. But as we all know from past videos, that can switch, turn of a dime. He can start yelling and throwing things and kicking things and cussing and calling people names. Just like that. So... Maybe, maybe maybe the next video will will carry that over. But thank you very much for watching. Um, my volition, I feel I must make this clear, my volition is not to harm anyone with this video. My volition is basically just to show uh, the pitfalls and landmines that you 
a correct sentence structure, communication, partially syntax, grammar, potential student ought perhaps to look out for. Make sure you can certify everything that's being said, that you can prove it to yourself. And your most useful tool, in my estimation, as a correct sentence structure, communication, partially syntax, grammar tutor of six plus years, is the etymology dictionary. Look every single word up for yourself. Instead of assuming that a word like family, oh, family is no contract because it has the L-Y. Wrong. Look it up. L-Y is not credentialed as a suffix the way it is in verily. You just have to look it up and put the work in. It's that simple. And of course, I do provide confidential workshops to those serious folks who are interested. And you can check that out and apply for that with the email address at the bottom of your screen. If you're going to contact me, I ask that you include your full correct name. Please don't be one of these people that just send me an email with your first name or your nickname. Come on, folks. It's common consideration. You know my full correct name. You know what I look like. I just ask the same consideration to you. Rule one, rule equal. All right. Thank you for joining me. See you in the next one.